All right, go ahead and take your seats as you're coming in. We're gonna get started with a couple announcements before we start the program. We're excited to have you here post Thanksgiving and pre uh, finals. So it's an interesting time on campus. Um, today's program is sponsored by the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, Women in Computer Science, Women in Economics and Business, and Alumni Engagement. And so we welcome our alumni that are in, in attendance via Zoom to this uh, time together. There will possibly be some time for Q&A at the end. So if you have a question, keep that and I'll come around the room or alums as well that have a question. We're excited about today. After this program, about 10 minutes after, starting about 1245, there will be a reception at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, where our speaker will be there to also to answer any questions you might have and just to uh, have a great time mingling and networking. That, and there is food included as well. So any of you that don't have commitments in classrooms, if you have commitments in classrooms, please go. Otherwise, if you have time, uh, feel free to come to CDI and be part of that presentation as well. This is our final McDermott Center speaker series for the semester, which again means you guys must be getting closer to finals, so that's exciting times. Um, and I'm going to uh, introduce our um, the person that is going to introduce our speaker. Now, as a reminder, as the, as the uh, the, the unit goes around, the tablet goes around, make sure you, by now you probably have it down, but put those zeros in front, use your student ID with all the zeros, make sure you're uh, included in the attendance for today and get credit for that as well. But let's get started. Welcome again, alumni. We thank you for joining us today. It's a beautiful sunny day on campus. Wish we were hosting you here, but we are thankful that you are online and a part of this. I want to introduce Grace Todd, who's our Senior Management Fellow, also part of the Women in Computer Science group, as well as the President of the Consulting Group. We're going to miss her. Uh, we got one more semester with her, but we're going to miss her because she's also worked at the McDermott Center uh, all of her career here, all of her time at DePaul. But Grace Todd is going to introduce our speaker. Hello everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today and now I'm going to introduce Darian Christian. Darian P. Christian is a community volunteer, philanthropist, wife, and mother who prides herself on being a perpetual learner. A native Hoosier, Darian was born and raised in Gary, Indiana from humble beginnings as the fifth child of a single parent steelworker. She is a first-generation college graduate with a BA in computer science from DePaul University and an MBA in management from the University of Notre Dame Mendoza College of Business. Darianne started her career with the Central Intelligence Agency after being recruited into the Stokes Scholar Program while still a student in high school. After several years with the CIA, Darianne spent the remainder of her career working in information technology as a program manager and consultant at various companies before leaving the workforce to care for her children exclusively. She was known as the fix-it guru and was often tasked to lead turnaround operations in failed information technology implementations. In the fall of 2017, the Justin and Darianne Christian Center for Diversity and Inclusion opened at her alma mater, DePaul University, where she is an active and engaged alumni. Darianne is married to Justin P. Christian, whom she met while studying at DePaul. They have been married 24 years and have four daughters, Channing, Layton, Sutton, and Ellington. In her spare time, she loves to travel, exercise, read, shop, and spend time with her family and friends. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Darianne Christian. Good morning, everyone. Grace, thank you for that warm introduction. I'd like to thank you all for showing up here today. Um, it's interesting that you showed up for a talk where you had no idea what the topic would be, so thank you. I'd like to say thank you to Dr. White and to the people in charge who thought I'd be a good candidate as a Darnell Alumni Fellow. Also, I'd like to issue a special thank you to the sponsors for, the, sponsors for this event, the McDermott Center, 
the DePaul Women in Computer Science and Economics, the Office of Alumni Engagement, and last but not least, the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. I'm going to assume that, you know, since you all are sitting here, that you probably read my bio either prior to or Grace just gave you a synopsis of my bio. And you are here because you're clearly curious about me. And um, inevitably, whenever people see my bio, there's one thing that everyone always seems to hone in on, and that's the fact that I worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. Well, I feel like I've had to tell that story in a lot of interviews as of late, so I won't rehash it here at the start of my talk, but if you have any questions and you're curious about my experience, feel free to ask me questions after. So I know you all sit through a lot of these talks as students here at DePauw, and everyone talks to you about leadership and the importance of being a good leader. And everything you've heard is probably true based on their experiences. If there's one thing I've learned in my time on this earth, it is the fact that DePaul people somehow always find themselves, as Lynn Manuel Miranda put it, in the room where it happens as leaders. But today I want to change the narrative a bit and talk to you about what it means to be a great leader in a non-traditional sense. The title of my talk is, Are You Built for the Pinch? And Can or Do You Thrive and Deliver in a Clutch? or in a crisis. While most of you truly aspire to be great leaders, entrepreneurs, C-suite executives, the next Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and love the limelight, I would venture to say there are probably a significant number of you who are like me. And what I mean is that you are a person that takes joy in serving and supporting others. But you don't necessarily want the spotlight, the responsibility, hassle, and oftentimes public criticism that comes with being a leader. Richard Heitner describes this type of person in his book, Leading from the Shadows, as someone that likes to see success in others, but who is comfortable giving up things like status, cash, overt, overt authority, because they simply get pleasure privately from seeing an outcome they want to see happen without the need for their name to be attached to it. There are some, like myself, where the rewards of working in the background and being hidden while others shine are even greater than the rewards of the leader or being in the spotlight oneself. Now, you all make up the social media generation, and I'm going to make an assumption that you are perfectly okay with your life and activities being public because, in all honestly, you don't know anything any different. It is the nature of the world that you have been brought up in. But honestly, there was a time when young men in the fraternities here at DePaul could do the boulder run in complete anonymity with no further record besides the testimony of his or her fellow fraternity brothers. His, I'm, I'm sorry, beside his fellow fraternity brothers. Today, however, it is highly likely that such events have a video recording of the event that will be eternally mortalized and replayed at reunions for many years to come. Now, for those of you listening in via Zoom online that aren't affiliated with DePaul, there used to be a boulder and a pond on campus that sits where the Green Center is. And I'm not sure if the boulder is even still here. But, for none, but nonetheless, for some reason, there's a tradition which I never fully understood the background of that involves young men in the fraternities getting fully undressed and running stark naked from their fraternity house to do a boulder run. And what's even more funny is that I was on campus a few years back for something with the CDI, and I turned to go into the back seat of my car to get my blazer. And when I turned around, guess what I saw? <laughs> Four young men, stark naked, in broad nadite, clearly doing a boulder run. <laughs> so go figure. Clearly the tra tradition continues to live on, even without the boulder, unless it is here somewhere. At any rate, the point I'm making is that I personally feel there's beauty in privacy and anonymity, something that your generation doesn't appear to have an appreciation for, but as you get older, I think you will. Okay, let's get back to what I was saying about, you know, leadership in a non-traditional sense. To be honest with you, I always saw myself as a leader. And it wasn't until about five years ago that I realized who I was, what I wanted to do, and how I wanted to use my skills and gifts. 
I had just given birth to my fourth child, and I was ready to move on from being a stay-at-home mom only. But my family with four kids and no family locally was in no position for me to go back to an all-in gig of any sort, nor did I want to start another business or find a place in corporate America. Because what I knew about myself as I was evaluating my options is that I really don't like a lot of the baggage that comes with being a leader in the traditional sense. I personally do not like the day in and day out grind of what, of what being a leader in the workplace means. People always looking at you for inspiration and answers, carrying the burden of the success or failure of others, sitting in all those meetings, responding to all those emails, and the constant, needs to, and the constant need to exercise restraint and be humble on a scale on par with Mother Teresa or Jesus. And yes, I do believe that without question, good leaders, effective leaders, the best leaders are extremely humble. A lot of people miss this, and that is why they fail miserably at leadership. For example, when my husband has that occasional conversation with me in the car or at the dinner table about an employee he may be struggling with, my kids will say, well, Dad, you own the company. Just tell him or her what to do, or better yet, fire them. <laughs> but good leaders know that you want people to work hard, not because you tell them to, but because they are inspired to do so. Great leaders know that is when you get the best work product. People will work hard for a tyrant out of fear, but only to a point. An humble leader, however, will have subordinates that will fall on the sword for him or her every time. For me personally, I have four kids, and I really don't have much left in terms of inspiring others by the time I finish with them. Plus, at this stage of my life, I'm only willing to be humble to a certain point. I have my limits. And as a result, there are certain leadership positions that I purposely avoid. In addition, another thing that I've learned about myself is that I am a sprinter, not a marathoner. I like to go into a situation, do what I do, and move on because I do get bored easily. And I love variety and ability to work on different things. Also, I really do love leading from the sidelines or in the background. I absolutely love the thrill associated with stepping in during a pinch, in the clutch, or a crisis. That is when I am at my best, and that is the sweet spot for me personally. And it didn't hit me until a very profound moment when my husband spoke about me in his speech as he was being inducted into the Indiana Business Hall of Fame back in 2016. And I will show you that clip. You can go ahead. But I will never forget one of our first customers a small non-for-profit located in Chicago. They needed some help, and boy, did we need a contract. <laughs> Our company was a small upstart with four to five employees. And as the CEO of the company, I didn't want to send the wrong message by attending the meeting myself. So my wife, Darianne, would attend the meeting on my behalf. She would use her maiden name to disguise that we were married. <laughs> that day, Darianne closed one of our first deals. <laughs> Darianne, the pinch hitter. Now, those of you who know me, and everybody in here knows now that I really love baseball. But I have always stood in awe of the pinch hitter. You see, this is the team member that, for the benefit of the organization, forgoes the fame that comes along with playing the game every day. The pinch hitter, many times, very capable of believing a superstar in their own right, but they set aside the need for individual statistics for the sake of the team. While I love the pinch hitter for all these reasons, the pinch hitter's true greatness lies in the fact that he or she knows how to deliver in the pinch or in the clutch. When a team has its back against the wall and they need a hit, they put their fate in the bat of the pinch hitter. Now, my wife inspires me to be the best father and husband that I can be. And like a true great pinch hitter, 
is always there for me in the clutch. She has never hesitated to step up to the plate Sorry. when necessary. Okay. So when Justin gave this speech, I don't watch baseball. So I didn't even know what a pitch hitter was. But what I took away from his speech that night is that I needed to find something to do that would allow me to pitch hit or step in during the clutch. Because that example he gave had been the story of my life wrapped up in 120 seconds. When I worked in corporate America, they always gave me crappy projects, stuff that was just jacked up and broken. But I did such a, guy, such a good job fixing up those messed up projects, it wasn't long before I was assigned the mission critical stuff. Then when I quit working to become a stay-at-home mom, it didn't matter if it was church or some type of community group, I was always called up to get stuff sorted out and make it happen. So I stand here before you all today because I know there's some pitch hitters in this room and possibly some tuning in via Zoom. And as, alum, as an alumni, I feel an obligation in this lecture to give you something you can use based on my own experience. Therefore, it is my hope that I can save you the agony of not figuring this out about yourself until you are 45 years old like I did five years ago. There's another clip that I want to show you, and I actually like this example of a pinch hitter better. For me, the baseball term pitch hitter is a bit too narrow. However, before I show the clip, I want to set the scene up for you because you all weren't even born when this movie came out. It is considered a cult classic and actually it used to be one of my husband's favorites as, and so as a result, I've seen it several times. I really don't watch TV maybe one to two hours every other month and if I do, it's generally a movie. It generally is a movie. And this movie had to grow on me. I only watched it at the time because it had one of my absolute favorite actors in it, and that was Samuel L. Jackson. And it is probably a bad example because of the nature of the movie. It is very dark with a lot of violence, drugs, and cursing. There are some scenes from a diversity, equity, and inclusion and access perspective that would be a complete no-no today. Also, I think it holds the records for the most use of the F word in a film. And the N-word is used many times, much to my disdain. But for the sake of this lecture, I will use this clip because I waited until last week to work on this lecture. <laughs> and it was the only example I could think of that depicts a crisis slash pinch slash clutch situation where a substitute or pinch hitter is called in to get others out of a grim or crisis situation. So the movie is Pulp Fiction. I do not own the rights to this movie and I am showing it here purely for educational purposes and I think I need to say that because the movie is copyrighted. So in this scene in particular, you have John Travolta, his character is named Vincent and Samuel Jackson plays Jules. And at this point, which is pretty early in the movie, they have just shot and killed this poor kid Marvin on accident as they are driving down the street in broad daylight. And Jules, who was driving the car, had to think quickly and call his friend Jimmy, played by Quentin Tarantino, who actually happens to be the director of the movie as well, because he is the only person they know in the neighborhood that Jules calls the 818 where they find themselves driving. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have any friends whose house I could show up at with a dead man in the backseat of a car. And so justifiably, Jimmy is ticked because they unwittingly brought him into some messed up stuff and made him an accessory to a murder unbeknownst to him without his consent. But he doesn't seem to be too concerned with that. He just wants the problem of the dead guy in the car that is now in his garage to go away because his wife will be home from work in about an hour as she will go ballistic over it. Surprise, surprise. Now, Jules and Vincent, they work for a guy named Marcellus and they call him because they have this problem of the dead guy in the back seat of the car. Their boss is busy, so he sends in a pinch hitter, AKA Mr. Wolf. You can run the seat. You're Jimmy, right? This is your house? Sure is. I'm Winston Wolf. I solve problems. Good, we got one. 
So I heard. May I come in? Uh, yeah, please do. You must be Jules, which should make you Vincent. Let's get down to brass tacks, gentlemen. If I was informed correctly, the clock is ticking. Is that right, Jimmy? Uh, 100%. Your wife, Bonnie, comes home at 9.30 in the a.m., is that correct? Uh-huh. I was led to believe if she comes home and finds us here, she wouldn't appreciate none too much. She wanted that. All right, that gives us 40 minutes to get the fuck out of Dodge. Which, if you do what I say, when I say it, should be plenty. Now, you got a corpse in a car, minus a head in a garage. Take me to it. Jimmy. Uh-huh? Do me a favor, will you? Don't let's melt some coffee back there. Would you make me a cup? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, um, how do you uh, take it? Lots of cream, lots of sugar. About the car, is there anything I need to know? Does it stall? Does it smoke? Does it make a lot of noise? Is there gas in it? Anything? Aside from how it looks, the car is cool. Positive. Don't get me out there on the road and find out the brake lights don't work. Hey, man, as far as I know, the motherfucker's tip top. Good enough. Let's go back to the kitchen. Here you go, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Jimmy. Hmm. Okay, first thing, you two. Take the body, stick it in the trunk. Now, Jimmy, this looks to be a pretty domesticated house. That would lead me to believe that in the garage you're under the sink, you got a bunch of cleaners and cleansers and shit like that? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Wolf, under the sink. Good. I need you two folks to do is take those cleaning products and clean the inside of the car. I'm talking fast, fast, fast. You need to go in the back seat, scoop up all those little pieces of brain and skull. Get it out of there. Wipe down the upholstery. Now, when it comes to upholstery, you don't need to be spick and span. You don't need to eat off it. Just give it a good once over. What you need to take care of are the really messy parts. The pools of blood that I've collected, you gotta soak that shit up. Now, Jimmy, we need to raid your linen closet. I need blankets, I need comforters, I need quilts, I need bedspreads. The thicker the better, the darker the better. No whites, can't use them. We need to camouflage the interior of the car. We're gonna line the front seat and the back seat and the floorboards with quilts and blankets. So if a cop stops us and starts sticking his big snout in the car, the subterfuge won't last. But at a glance, the car will appear to be normal. Jimmy, lead the way. Boys, get to work. Please would be nice. Come again? I said a please would be nice. Get it straight, Buster. I'm not here to say please. I'm here to tell you what to do. And if self-preservation is an instinct you possess, you better fucking do it and do it quick. I'm here to help. If my help's not appreciated, lots of luck, gentlemen. No, 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 Mr. Wolf. It ain't like that. Your help is definitely appreciated. Mr. Wolf, listen. I don't mean disrespect, okay? I respect you. I just don't like people barking orders at me, that's all. If I'm curt with you, it's because time is a factor. I think fast, I talk fast, and I need you guys to act fast if you want to get out of this. So pretty please, with sugar on top, clean the fucking car. Okay. So going forward, I'm going to describe the type of person I'm referring to here as either a problem solver or a pinch hitter. So I'll use those terms interchangeably as I go on throughout this conversation because for me, I feel the key characteristic of a pinch hitter is that they are a problem solver. And so after watching you know, these two clips, there's a few key assumptions we can make about pinch hitters or problem solvers. The first being they know who they are and how to solve problems. Mr. Wolf introduces himself by saying, hello, I'm Winston Wolf and I solve problems. Second, they are honed in their craft. Not just honed, but what we can assume is that not only are they really good, but they're probably the best at what they do. That is why people are willing to call on them at the most critical moments and relinquish complete control without any fear that they won't deliver what is needed in a pinch, a crisis, or the clutch. Three, there's an expectation amongst those that rely on the pitch hitter that they can and will deliver and get the job done. Four, we can assume that pitch hitters, knows that pinch hitters know this about themselves and that this is what others' expectations are, them, are of them. And as a result, they are the type of people that are always in the background perfecting their craft. As the rappers and hip hop, hip -hop artists say, they stay ready. 
The pinch hitter doesn't need the spotlight to stay motivated to hone their craft either. They do it because it is simply what they do. Or some are gifted in that they have some sort of innate talent or gift or sense of discernment about people, situations, about people and situations that others simply do not have. People trust them because they have integrity. When you are vulnerable and in an extreme position of need or a crisis, everyone, it's just human nature, wants someone they trust on their team. Now, you all are looking at me like, Darian, you are talking about integrity, and these guys just murdered someone and are conspiring to cover it up. <laughs> and I know this movie clip is probably not the best example from an integrity perspective, because clearly they are all criminals. But I need you to work with me because let's, you know, we've all heard the proverb, there's honor among thieves. And what that statement is referring to is the concept of professional courtesy that even the disreputable and unethical, and in this case criminal, do amongst themselves, particularly amongst themselves, adhere to various sorts of moral codes of conduct. And in this, in, in this instance, Jules, Vincent, and Jimmy trusted Mr. Wolf to cover up their criminal behavior and get them out of a pinch and stay quiet about it for forever. Problem solvers that excel in crisis situations think well on their feet and that they know how to read the room, read people, and assess problems with an acute level of precision that others do not have. Notice how when Mr. Wolf asked to see the problem, they took him to the garage and in a matter of 30 seconds, he evaluated the problem and formulated the plan. Mr. Wolf even said it. Look, I think fast, I talk fast, and I need you to act fast. They often pick up on details that others completely miss because they are detail-oriented to a fault and are always thinking ahead. Notice how he asked about the condition of the car, knowing that Jules would be driving while black in America, and how a non-working taillight could be a disastrous situation for a black man encountering the police, especially with a dead man in the trunk of a car. Now problem solvers are master planners in that after assessing the situation, they know exactly what needs to be done without missing a single step that is required in the process to bring the situation to the desired end. And they always prepare for the unexpected, the what ifs that others don't even consider. Notice how even though Mr. Wolf knew the car was in good working condition because Jules told him it was, therefore it was not likely they'd get pulled over by the police, he still prepared for that possibility anyway. And as a fellow pinch hitter or problem solver, my frustration is often when I have to work with people that need all of the details. And you know who you are, the people that need to know the why. I call them the control freaks without a clue. Because, because if they were truly smart, they put together the why when you told them the what. But what my husband and a lot of others around me have told me on countless occasions over the years is that, Darian, not everyone gets or sees the stuff that you do. For example, in this clip, we all understand why the blankets needed to be dark and not white when Mr. Wolf said it. But we have all been in the room when some, I want to be the smartest guy in the room, sucks all the air out of the room trying to be scientific and giving a thesis on why white blankets could possibly work in this circumstance and yada, yada, yada. And that is why that person is not the pinch hitter. And if that's you, you aren't the pinch hitter either. Because that person wants to impress others and that is not a trait of the pinch hitter. Now back to the pinch hitter. Please know that this is a frustration of the pinch hitter and having to work with people that don't get it and who even when given the best laid plans cannot follow through, keep up, or execute. Another key characteristic of a pinch hitter or a problem solver is that they aren't pushovers. They are not afraid to say what needs to be said even if it will tick some people off or hurt feelings. They know there is no room for sugarcoating things in the clutch and they will tell you the cold, hard, unfiltered truth whether you like it or not. They are brutally honest, and they can be because they have nothing to lose. They are not the owners of the problem, and this is arguably one of their greatest strengths 
and that people need them and not the other way around, and they know this. They have nothing to lose. You have to remember, they aren't motivated by the same things as the typical leader. They don't need admiration, praise, or the glory. They are able to stay focused when most others get sidetracked by their ego. Notice how when Vincent challenged Mr. Wolf, Mr. Wolf was taken aback because he was thinking, well, didn't you just call me and not the other way around? But he wasn't bothered, nor did he feel pressure to go back and consensus build or get buy-in on his plan. The plans were the plans. He addressed Vincent as he did because he's not a leader in the traditional sense. He doesn't have to choose his words carefully to be motivational and encouraging because others don't have the same expectations of him they would of a typical leader. And last but not least, they don't advertise their skills or their abilities. Those around them know exactly what they are capable of and when to call them to use those skills in a pinch, crisis, or the clutch. At this point by now, there are some of you saying to yourself, I think I'm a pitch hitter and a problem solver, but how do I know for sure? Because the appeal of being Mr. Wolf for some of you is real after watching this clip. Mr. Wolf works for no one. Also, he has connections in that he knows people who know people that can get the things done that he calls for. He is for hire, but clearly he chooses the jobs that he wants to do. The byproduct of that is that he owns his time. And hear me when I say this. If you are in a position where you can own your time, you have succeeded. In life and are exceedingly well off. You are the wealthiest of the wealthy, assuming you are in good health with all of your most basic fundamental and financial needs attended to. There is one thing that we all get in equal measure, 24 hours a day that we cannot accumulate and save up for later. Some of us have very little and some of us have a lot. If you have the option to dictate how your time is spent, that is true success. As a student, you won't have an appreciation or understanding of what I'm saying, but one day you will. So how do you know if you are a true pinch hitter or a problem solver? Well, number one, people often come to you for help when they are in precarious situations. People will call you to explain difficult conversations and get your read on the situation. They will ask for your advice on what to say or do before going into difficult situations or they might just ask you to go with them to observe, knowing that you will pick up on things that they won't. When you're in a group that has been presented with the problem, you generally know exactly what needs to be done and how to bring all the moving parts and people together to get the job done. Many times you can do this long before everyone else has had a chance to even fully understand what the problem at hand is. You don't like the spotlight, but you love helping others shine or helping people deal with and work out their own problems. You're not afraid to speak up and be honest. Passive aggressive types aren't pitch hitters and you, and you have to put yourself in a situation where you can do that without any repercussions. I'm gonna say that again. You are not afraid to speak up and be honest and you have to put yourself in a situation where you can do that without any repercussions. Focusing on developing others is not your strong suit, and that is okay for pinch hitters and problem solvers. Now, for traditional leaders, that is a non-negotiable requirement of the job. But pinch hitters and problem solvers are brought in to do a job. They know how to identify the talent needed to get that job. Getting people to, getting people to do what you need them to do comes easy for you because people in the clutch or a crisis are scared, but they trust you. Why? You are confident and you have a plan. And you know how to communicate that plan with detail and precision in such a way that people readily listen and act. Another thing is that you don't like focusing on any one thing for too long. You like to do what you do and get in and get out. To move on to the next problem or thing that piques your interest. You are not a nine to five person. The notion of getting up and going into a job day after day does not appeal to you and quite frankly, you don't do it well. There have been projects and jobs that I completely bombed because they simply did not appeal to my strengths and the characteristics that I now know about myself. 
Another trait is that you are an expert at reading people and reading the room. You know how to read the room with a level of precision and accuracy that you don't see in others. And you will know you have this trait because after meetings, group sessions, or just being out with friends, and you guys are all talking about that at the end, you know, having a casual conversation, but you'll be sitting there saying to yourself, were they in the same meeting that I was? Now this can go two ways. You can be the person that is clueless about really transpired, what really transpired at the meeting, and that is why you're asking that question. So make sure that isn't you, because if it is, you're not the problem solver for obvious reasons. But for the pinch hitter, in general, you're the person that picked up on the nuances of body language, what wasn't said but was clearly expressed that everyone else missed. You were able to discern what the likely outcome for the next meeting or planning session would be, even though that topic was tabled for discussion next time. It took me a long time before I was aware of this trait in myself or even willing to accept this about myself. I was brought up in a very, very religious home. The only person put on a pedestal was Jesus. So you get where I'm going. If Jesus is the only standard you grow up with and the measuring stick, inevitably you get to the point where any and everything about you will not be seen as anything special. And you can learn to blow off and overlook things about yourself much to your own detriment, which is what I did. You learn to be humble because the humble don't stumble. That was, and to a certain degree, still is my mentality. So far be it for me to see myself as someone more discerning than others, but that seemed to be the consensus and has been for most of my life amongst those that really know me. However, I always brush that trait off. Because typically, it's human nature to overestimate your gifts and underestimate your faults or weaknesses. However, it has only been recently that I started to accept what everyone else noticed about me and what I couldn't see in myself. I would constantly find myself in situations where I would be in a group and something would happen and my read on the situation would be completely different from everyone else's. And what I found was that people would be taking in what I was saying intently because what I was saying was completely logical, but they had totally missed it. Now, back to the problem solvers. How do you know? You pitter out when the rigors of the mundane and the day-to-day -day kicks in. And what do I mean by pitter out? This is when you do your worst or lose focus. I've had assignments at jobs that I did not do well because I, needed to, because I need to fix something or be in on the action. When I wasn't, this is when I would find myself doing, doing, my, doing the worst. You, have, you are a person that has no desire to work on the same thing and you want to work on the big picture and the master plan, delegate the work to others, see it through, and then move on. If this describes you and your mentality, you might be a pinch hitter or a problem solver. At this point in your life, I think it is really too early to tell, but nonetheless, you should at least know what this looks like because it might be who you are, and the sooner you figure it out, the better because no one wants to be stuck doing something that they don't love. Hopefully by honing in on these traits, you won't waste time doing something you hate or being miserable without a clue as to where you should focus your time, talent, and treasure. There's nothing worse than not knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are and using that knowledge to determine your true calling in life. I will close by sharing with you a story from earlier this year. It is February 2021, and I am living in the midst of a pandemic. But at this moment in particular, the one I'm referencing, I am living my best life on a yacht in the Exumas with my husband, no kids, and two other couples for Valentine's Day, similar to Mr. Wolf, when my phone starts buzzing like crazy. Some of you, the pinch hitters, the problem solvers in the room, picked on the fact that Mr. Wolf was also living his best life because he was still wearing a tuxedo at 8.30 in the morning. And if you missed that, pinch head may not be your calling. Anyhow, back to my story. We are on the final full day of our trip and we are sailing back to Nassau. And as a result, our Wi-Fi and phone service, even on the yacht with the VSAT, is really sketchy because we are sailing through all of these uninhabited islands in the Exumas. 
But nonetheless, I start sporadically getting all these text messages from home. And if you know black people, they'll just start texting you, assuming you know what's going on, because you have to remember that at that time, everyone was still at home, unvaccinated, glued to the TV, dealing with the pandemic. And no one had any knowledge of the fact that I was purposely off the grid. At any rate, the text I received about the issue at hand were very cryptic in that they didn't share the details of what had happened. But they did have ample criticism and critiques of the situation and new fields in them. All I knew was that new fields was clearly being called out for something that was not sitting well with the black and brown people at home. For those of you who don't know what new fields is, it is a cornerstone cultural institution in Indianapolis made up of a 100 acre park in the center of the city, along with a 40 acre garden, the historical Lily House, and it is the home of the Indianapolis Museum of Art, along with a $400 million endowment and an encyclopedic art collection consisting of over 43,000 works of art, and I am a board member there. I then get a call from a dear friend of mine, Brian Payne, over at CICF, and my phone actually works. And the call comes through, and we get to talk for about 20 minutes before it drops, and I'm in another dead zone, because as I told you, the boat was moving through the Exumas. Now, mind you, I had been trying to place calls and send emails unsuccessfully to figure out what was going on all day based on the text I had been receiving. But Brian's call, when it got through to me, it really scared me because at that moment, I immediately knew without him saying a word that it was bad. And the next 24 hours of my trip were, trip were tough. I was so excited for the time with friends, but from a communication perspective, I was striking out. I was trying to communicate with other board members, the board chair, and join Zoom, Zoom calls, but Wi-Fi was not my friend. I could only hear every other word, and the Zoom meeting was basically a pixelated frozen puzzle screen. Then on top of everything else, Newfield's trustees received a letter from a group of activists, employees, and volunteers with a list of demands calling for change at Newfield's and the removal of the CEO. During that time, I was lucky that I somehow managed to either eke out a phone call or an email exchange. I can't remember which one it was or exactly how we communicated, but I communicated with the Newfields board chair, Katie Bentley, DePaul class of 1964. Once again, you have a DePaul person in the room where it happens in a leadership role. But nonetheless, she wanted to know when I'd be back. I told her that I'd get back at 4 p.m. the next day. She promptly scheduled the board of trustees meeting for 4 p.m. the following day. We had that trustee meeting and made some tough decisions as a board. And I can tell you, I was glad I wasn't Katie Bentley. Newfields was in the hot seat for sure in a very public way. And the pinch hitter in me was glad to not be at the helm. One of the byproducts of that meeting or shortly thereafter was a statement to the world apologizing and asking for more time, 30 days to be exact to assess the situation and formulate a plan to attempt to right a very grave wrong. Well, surprise, surprise, who do you think Katie called to lead the committee to work on that plan? And I'll be 100% honest with you. Even with my innate need to be a problem solver and step in during a pinch, or crisis, or the clutch, I can tell you that initially I was not jumping at the chance to step into the fire on this one. In spite of the fact that I already had a pretty clear read on what we needed to do to make this better in the short run, I was clearly ready to simply throw out some suggestions at a meeting and get back to my very busy pandemic life. You see, at the time I had four kids at home full time and I was busy. I was the cleaning lady, short order cook, and homeschool teacher to my five-year-old. But Katie was not taking no for an answer. Plus, I really did want to do what I could to help Newfields navigate its way through this and be better. And for obvious reasons, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access is important to me. But you see, the problem with 
DEIA work is that it is never easy. You can't assign DEIA work tasks to folks, and the number one thing to consider with DEI work is that it takes time, a lot of time. And if you were listening to me earlier, you know that pinch hitters and problem solvers like to get in, formulate the plan, and get out. I inherently knew that that wouldn't be the case with this crisis. And the jury is still out on whether we came up with a good plan that will produce the results we are hoping for at new fields. Because even with the best laid plans, when it comes to DEIA, we all have a very long way to go. Now hopefully we can circle back in a few years and say our plan for change during that crisis actually worked. So last but not least, you're probably wondering what do I do and what does being a pinch hitter look like for me in the real world? Well, for me, first and foremost, I am a wife to the absolute best guy ever that I met here at DePaul, who every time he brings our girls to campus, shows them the spot behind me on Locust Street and says to the girls, this is the spot where I first laid eyes on your mom. Second, I am a mom to Channing, Layton, Sutton, and Ellington, and in my home, my family business, and on some, but not all, of the boards I serve on, I am a pinch hitter and a problem solver. I often joke that I have somehow become a professional board member. That is what I do, and that's what I love doing with my time. Being a board member is the perfect job for problem solvers like myself. However, I want to caveat that statement with I will not be taking on any more unpaid board assignments, so don't call me. <laughs> However, if you're paying, we can talk. Well, that's my time, and thank you for listening to my story. Hi, my name is Katie Field. I'm a first year here in the Management Fellow Program. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak more on, you talked about like understanding your own traits and yourself to better become a, a pinch hitter. And I was wondering like how that process like looked for you, if you could shed more light on that. Sure. So um, as a lot of you know, I'm a stay at home mom and I went to DePaul. My husband and I started, well my husband started our business, our family business. And, um, you know, I was at home as a stay-at-home mom for about, you know, 13 years before I started to think about, okay, I'm ready to go back to work. But after being home for 13 years, you know, I hadn't worked. I wasn't sure who would even want to hire me. And I really had to assess, like, well, what is it I want to do? And what is it about myself? You know, because I, one of the things I had was I had wisdom on my side. At that point, I was 45 years old. And so if you don't know yourself by then, you know, that's a problem. Um, but nonetheless, I just, you know, I started to really be more introspective, you know, about who I was and what I wanted to do and what I enjoyed doing. Because I feel like today, you know, you guys have to learn, your generation has to learn how to drown out the noise of what, you know, the appearances because of social media of what success really looks like. Because, you know, based on what you see out there today, you're basically, I feel like, being so somewhat of a lie, right? That being successful or happy is related to what you have and how much you have and, you know, and, you know, whether, you know, you're an entrepreneur or whether you're a leader or, you know, all of these things that, you know, you constantly see just being fed to you, you know? And so at that, and so what you have to do is you can live your whole life chasing that and just be miserable. You know, I saw an interview with Elon Musk, and he talked about how many hours a week he worked. Now, granted, he's doing something that he's very passionate about, so for him, I guess it's not work, but at the same token, it's like really, you know, evaluating yourself and figuring out what really matters to you, what is valuable to you, what are your skills, because you may have some skills that you don't enjoy doing. Like, I'm a good cook, but I don't necessarily want to cook all the time. Right, so you have to figure out what skills you have that you really like that you want to then focus in on those and use them to do whatever it is you want to do. Hopefully, I answered your question. Yeah. Yep. Anyone else? Da, da, da. Oh, here we go. Got two. Go back here first. Thank you. 
Hi, Dorian. My name is Sarah. Thank you for your speech. And I'm wondering if some of us were to be able to identify ourselves as pinch hitters, who would you say are the best people to have in your corner in a general sense? Could you identify those people? Other DePaul people. And I'm going to say that because, you know, what's interesting is I was a stay-at-home mom. I had been a stay-at-home mom for 15 years, and I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And what is interesting for me is that I find myself that a lot of these opportunities I've received, you know, they've been pretty great opportunities for someone, for someone who hadn't worked for like 14, 15 years to then just come off the bench and find yourself in some of these positions. You know, for me, I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, I always tell the students, like, what you're learning here, your liberal arts education is great, but the real thing you get is the DePaul network. That's the real value. To give you an example, um, I sit on the board of a publicly traded company where I get paid to go to five meetings a year and read some documents and weigh in on them. And I get pr paid pretty well to do that. And that came to be because, guess what? The chairman of the board, his son went to DePaul, and the president of the company is a DePaul graduate. And so when they started interviewing me for that position, I was thinking, they can get anybody. Why do they want me? You know, I've been a stay-at-home mom, you know, for the past 15 years. But I had served on a board with other people, and two of the gentlemen that were on that board who were interviewing me for that position, I actually had served on a not-for-profit board with them, and the gentleman who was, um, who had recommended me for that position, he, you know, it's the board where you stay on until age 72, and so when he recommended me and it came out that I was a DePaul graduate, it was almost like it was a no-brainer, like even the interviews for it, it was just talking, to, you know, we were, you know, they asked me, you know, a couple of difficult questions, but pretty much we talked about DePaul a lot and that's how I find my, found myself there and even in our business and even you know myself as a you know a minority and as a female there's a lot of um, challenges I'm faced with where you know people immediately make assumptions or judgments about you and what I found is that whenever people found out I had graduated from DePaul the narrative completely changed it was like all of a sudden oh you deserve to be here or okay you know this works and the same thing and my husband will tell you the same thing in business you know when you know we started out as a startup trying to you know make sales you know we were really really young like 23 and 25 when um my husband's you know quit his job and started the business so i would say as a pinch hitter you want other depaul people in your corner awesome we have actually run out of time now, so some students have to get back to campus. But again, if you want to uh, join us at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in about 15 minutes, please do so. Otherwise, let's give Darian a round of applause. Yes.